Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, IP attorney Nancy Delane brings us a license agreement that might be too simple. So let's tear it down. Nancy Delane, welcome to the Contract Teardown Show. How are you today? I am well, Mike. Thank you for having me. I am glad to have you. We're talking about some stuff. I, it seems like a lot of these business lawyers are dealing with IP issues, and so uh, it seemed important that we dig into it. What we're going to do is talk about this document I'll share with the folks at home. This is a licensing agreement. This agreement is between Momentum Biofuels uh, and Global Resources, two companies that are licensing some stuff, and we'll talk about what that is. But uh, before we do, tell us about this document. When are we going to run into this kind of thing? Uh, you're going to run into this kind of thing with any business that wants to make money with its intellectual property. The way to make money with intellectual property, it's, well, it's twofold. The first thing you can do is sell it outright, um, which does not involve licensing at all. It's just a, it, it's a sale of an asset. Uh, but the other way you make money with intellectual property is to license people to use your intellectual property. And that is the, that's the, um, the context under which, under which you would find a licensing agreement. All right, and we'll dig into whether they've done this well or not. But before we do, tell us about your background. What brings you to documents like this? I'm an intellectual property lawyer. I, I went to law school to become an intellectual property lawyer. I also do some business law, but, uh, but my main thrust is IP. And I came late in life to the law. I, was, uh, I graduated from law school on the same weekend as my 25th college reunion. Wow. Uh, and uh, so I had had a life before I started law school, and my life before I started law school was as a writer. I was a technical writer, and I spent a lot of time working with uh, the companies uh, that I was, my employer's intellectual property, and it was just fascinating. So when I went to law school, I knew perfectly well that I didn't want to handle your wills, and I didn't want to handle your divorces, and I certainly didn't want to handle your criminal matters. So uh, I, I, I went to law school pretty much to become an IP lawyer, and I have the technical background to have the patent ticket in my pocket, so I, I sat for the patent bar as well as the state bar, and here I am. Nice. 20 years later. Yeah, I came in to law school late uh, as well, did it with four small kids in tow, which I recommend to no one. Uh, <laughs> So with I that, had a pre-teenage daughter. Uh, yeah, no, maybe that's worse. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's harder. Uh, my teenagers like to break down my will and my self-esteem. Um, so getting into this document. So we're going to talk about whether they've done this well or not, right? Uh, as we always are want to do on the show. But to get started, I want to back step it a little bit and get into uh, the preamble here because it sort of details what is this thing? What is it trying to do? But might not do it well. Talk to us about what this document is doing. What's the relationship between these two parties? And does this witness Seth section lay it out well? The relationship between these two parties... Um... It looks like Momentum Biofuels is a licensor. They have some intellectual property that they want to make money with. Uh, and Global Resources wants to use the technology that provides that uh, Momentum Biofuels is providing to further their business. And they're willing to pay, they're willing to pay Momentum Biofuels uh, for the privilege of doing that, which is what a license, that's the basis of a licensing agreement, but it is the bare basis. Um, in the witnesses, th in the witnesseth section, it would be ideal to have the exact form of the intellectual property spelled out. This particular agreement says, Licensor has invented and owns certain processes, techniques, and formulas that combine to create a unique method of producing biofuels and derivative products. Okay, that's great. What are you protecting here? Okay, and how are you protecting? Is there a patent involved here or a family of patents? If so, I need those patent numbers. I need those patent numbers in this agreement because otherwise otherwise it's void for vagueness. Or is this is this uh is are these processes and and uh techniques and formulas trade secret to momentum biofuels? If so, I need a reference to the non-disclosure agreement. I need to know that when I disclose my trade secret to Momentum Biofuels, they're going to treat it as a trade secret, and they're not going to come out and say, oh, 
thank you very much because now we can go and, and take this and do what we want with it and disclose it to the world and your trade secret's just going to fly away because secrets are secret as only as long as you keep your mouth shut. Mm. Yeah, this sort of sounds like marketing language almost where they're sort of vaguely, you know, the front page of the website saying, talking about their their unique methods, but I'm not sure to your point what they're protecting. Well, let's talk about the conveyance of it. Uh, that is the first section, section one here, uh, says that the licensor conveys to licensee the exclusive right to use, improve, sub-license, and commercialize the intellectual property described herein for a period of 10 years subject to the rest of the agreement. What do you think about this conveyance clause? Well, the conveyance clause is good. The, the conveyance clause does what it's supposed to do. Um, it's, uh, it, it conveys the right to the... Uh, uh, the right from the licensor to the licensee to uh, use, improve, sublicense, commercialize the intellectual property. There are a couple of things I don't know about this conveyance clause. Um, first of all, is this an exclusive license? Is, is, the, is this licensee the only licensee with the right to use this intellectual property? Um, and I don't necessarily need to know that here, but it is important to know that because um, the price that the uh, that an exclusive license brings back to the to the licensor uh, is usually very different from the price that a non-exclusive license brings back. Um, an, an exclusive license tends to be tends to be higher priced. Um, what do you think about the ten year timeline? Does that change? I assume a lot of the depth of the rest of the drafting. It, it, you know, we've talked about this on the show often. You don't want the contract complexity to outpace the complexity of the problem the contract aims to solve. It, it seems like if you're agreeing to 10 years, this better be a pretty long document, right? You're dealing with a lot of time. What do you, what do you think about that 10-year timeline? Well, the 10-year timeline, yeah, it's a long time, and things happen. Um, it's a long time, and with the rest of the document, there, there are things that belong in this document that aren't there because of that 10-year clause, things like a force majeure clause, uh, things like, uh, you know, a way out. Um, if, you know, if somebody goes bankrupt, what happens? Um, if somebody, uh, you know, if th th this this document is set in Texas, that's the governing law, um, and I'm suspecting that both parties probably have their have their domiciles in Texas. Uh, so the um, Texas gets hit by things like hurricanes and dust storms. Uh, so it's you know th there needs to be something in there that 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 mm -hmm. takes care of eventual you know acts of God. Uh, and there's no, I, I didn't see a force majeure clause in, the, in this um, in this contract. And given the period over which this license agreement sh uh, will uh, will transpire, I really would want to see one. Right. Yeah. As an aside, maybe. Right. Like if it to your earlier point about what are we licensing exactly? If this is ten years access to, you know we use red anytime we write on a contract, you know, if it's some like really narrow piece of, of information of intellectual property, who can, you know, even if it's 10 years, it's not that complex a deal. But as far as we know here, this is like talent transferring people's ability to make freaking rocket fuel. I mean, there's just no way to, to know what this is. So um, yeah, you got to meet the complexity of the, of the issue, but we just don't know how complex this deal is. Absolutely. You get, and the complexity of the issue as at this point, as you say, totally in play. We have no clue. Yeah. So let's talk about two, the royalty as consideration for the license granted. Uh, the licensee agrees to pay license or a royalty equal to 3% of gross and collected revenue for all, all biodiesel and related products. Apparently we're dealing with biodiesel uh, produced by the licensee and 3% of the gross revenue. Uh, wh what do you think about the royalty section, section two here? Well, the royalty amount is okay. You know, that, that's a negotiated amount between the parties. Um, but boy, I can tell you, probably the licensor and the licensor's attorney are in love with that language because it calls for gross. Okay, if I were the licensee's lawyer, I would be fighting long and hard to get that, get that word gross to turn into the word net mm. um, because... Uh, you know, a gross revenue that that's money you collect. That that doesn't take that doesn't take into account returns. It doesn't take into account. Um, uh, it doesn't. You know, it it doesn't take it doesn't take anything other than the money you collect into into account. And uh, you know that that for a licensee that that's just horrible. Um, you know, it's great for the like great for the licensor, but the licensee, mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I wonder what the margins are in biofuels, you know, because there's so many subsidies and, and uh, tax benefits. I, I, I have no idea, honestly, how much they're having to pay for 
for actually producing this product. Uh, well, let's go down to the boilerplate section. You know, you get into the stuff that we all see over and over. Uh, I should point out this document itself is only eight sections. Uh, it's fairly short, but we do have some boilerplate in there. We see entire agreement. We see enforceability. As you pointed out, we don't see force majeure. What do you think about these sort of standard uh, uh, bits that come later in the contract? Well, the uh, the uh, you know the entire agreement clause is good. You know, it, it's a it's a pretty standard entire agreement clause. You know, the, this it, it's the four corners and and it can only be changed in a writing. I'm happy with that. Um, uh, the question that I have is what constitutes a written instrument? I mean, does email count? Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, but but it does say that the that the uh, that the written instrument must be executed by each of the parties. So presumably. Presumably, you need something. You need at least an acknowledgement of an email that says, "Yeah, okay, we can do it that way." But, uh, but um, you know, it's it's just uh, it's one of these things that it, it's a pretty it's a pretty standard um, uh, in, uh, entire agreement clause. Um, the enforceability clause um, that also is pretty standard, um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I I would have no changes to the enforceability clause. I don't think um, the uh, govern the governance clause. That's state of Texas. I'm in New York. I would write state of New York, but you know that's because I'm in New York, um, and uh, it it becomes a bo both of these parties are in Texas, so it doesn't surprise me that this is a Texas contract. Okay, um, so but but uh, but you know with the with the with the governance clause, I would really like to see some you know. Just because the 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 um, the contract is so long in term, somebody may pick up and move. Mm -hmm. So if somebody picks up and move, what happens if the laws of the state to which they move conflict with the laws of Texas? How are we? You know, is, is there is there some? You know, I I would like to see a provision in there that deals with the conflict of laws. Mm. Well, and you also mentioned in preparation, uh, you know, we recently released an ebook about venue, about uh, defining venue in documents. And I, I don't see that this even touches I don't that. see venue in here either. And Texas is a big place, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if this if these folks are, you know, if the licensor is in Houston and the licensee is in Amarillo, they're going to have to decide where they're going to where they're going to uh, to uh, fight about this contract. Um, and there's nothing in there that says, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, you know, venue is proper in Houston or venue is proper in Amarillo. Um, I'm pick, I'm picking parts of Texas that I happen to know are far apart. Um, <laughs> they are, I've driven those places there. They're quite far. Well, I, you know, in closing, I, I'm thinking of the, the big picture, something that has come up throughout our conversation about this document is we don't actually know if this document if the complexity of the document matches the complexity of the situation. You, you mentioned in preparation for our call that when you're writing a document like this, a lot of times you're not just talking to the parties. It's not just about, you're also talking to the judge who's oh, going to unwind this to thing. Judge. Right, who's going to unwind this thing later. So talk to us about about how you don't get over complex for the deal, right? This might be a simple deal, depending on what this thing is that they're sharing. But this sounds like we're talking biofuel technologies. This sounds like it could be a really complicated deal. And maybe this document isn't matching what a judge needs to know later. Talk to us about drafting with the judge in mind. This is simply a case of audience analysis. Every time I write a contract, I bear, I, I have in mind the fact that I'm not writing for the parties. I'm not writing for the parties at all. Okay. I am writing for that person who's sitting up there in that black robe who has never seen this deal before and who needs to interpret what these people are fighting about who are in front of him or her. Um, and so this document doesn't tell me that. Okay. I don't know enough from this document and understand that this document may, this document may have had, um, may have had corollary documents associated with it. I don't know. But just on the face of this document, this doesn't tell me, near, this would not tell a judge nearly enough. So I would, I would include all, of, I would include at least references to the corollary documents in the, in this main document. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, I would say, you know, th this document is, uh, this document covers patent number, 
10,999,999. Uh, 10, uh, or it covers, uh, and, and, you know, see, and, and then I would attach a copy of the, of the patent to as an appendix. Um, or I would say, uh, this, this document cover, covers trade secrets, and here's, a, here's the, here's the non-disclosure agreement. So I, I would tend to bundle this a lot more than this has been bundled. Yeah. Um, because I want that judge to have all four corners. Right now, right now the judge has, there's an awful lot of room in, of, for interpretation in this document. And when I'm going in front of a judge, I don't want that judge to have any wiggle room at all. I yeah, really and I, I feel like we've talked about this with contract design. Sure, have a document that sort of lays out the broad view of what this is because that's what executives are going to read. They're not going to go get into the details. But for the, if you're going to do that, then don't have whereases and heretofores and witnesses in there. They don't care, right? No, they don't. At, at least give us an executive summary that looks like an executive summary and then attach to your point the documents that answer the questions that the judge is going to have. I think that's really useful advice. Uh, Nancy, we appreciate you bringing it to us. Uh, for people who want to reach out to you and learn more about your practice and your IP uh, wisdom, what's the best way to connect with you? Oh, you can do it by one of several ways. Uh, the fastest way to do it is probably by telephone, which is 518, area, yeah, um, in the United States, so plus fun, 518-371-4599. Or you can uh, you can certainly visit my website and talk to my chat bot, which is uh, ipattorneyfirm.com. That's I as an in intellectual, P as in property, attorneyfirm.com. Uh, or you can send me an email, which is N, N as Nancy, B as in boy, Delane, D-E-L-A-I-N, at ipattorneyfirm.com. That's perfect. We'll include all that information over at the blog post at linesider.com slash resources. And if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show and beat up documents like this, just email us. We are at community at lawinsider.com. Nancy, I thank you, and we will see you all next time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. If you're enjoying the show, Please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.